Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time we're talking to one of the Houston Chamber Choir's tenors, Jack Byram. Jack, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. When did you join the choir, Jack? 2014. So I've now, I think I've now officially, or about to complete six seasons. And what was it that made you want to join the choir? Well, so I actually, uh, I have, I don't really have the traditional music career. I'm, I'm a lawyer and I, I moved to Houston to take a legal position and I, uh, in 2013, and I spent my first six or seven months not singing. And, and after that period realized that was a huge mistake and that I really wanted to sing. And I had some, some contacts that I was able to get in touch with here who all said, if you want to sing in a choir in Houston, you have to get in touch with Bob. You have to, everyone kept saying, you've got to talk to Bob Simpson. So I contacted him and, and it was sort of serendipitous. There was a, a couple months while I was waiting for the end of their season, but they had a tenor opening and, and I fit right in and have, have never, never left and don't plan to anytime soon. So what's it been like being part of the choir? Uh, it is a truly amazing experience and, and not one that I've had in a lot of other ensembles. I, I've sung in colleges. I've sung in some other professional groups. Uh, I have sung in some volunteer groups and, and the really, the, the Houston Chamber Choir is different and, and something I take a lot of pride in for a lot of different reasons. One is just that the, the, the quality of sound that the choir produces and it, it's, it's something that's been consistent since I've been in the choir. It's just phenomenal and on and really I think we've, we've been able to prove to some extent now can compete with it would be up there with any of uh any of the ones you may have heard of uh but so there's that and it's also the fact that we're all from Houston and it's a it is a Houston-based choir of Houston singers and we get together every Monday uh at least during normal time and and we all go back to our to our daily lives and there's something about that that provides an aspect of community that I think helps us make a better musical product it's 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 really unique a lot of a lot of organizations around the country are not able to do that what is it then that gives the houston chamber choir its uniqueness you know that's a really interesting question because and i think a lot of a lot of people a lot of guest conductors that we have they ask that question and i you know bob chilcott recently from from the uk was here last year with us and and has said, you know, I remember him specifically saying to Bob, how come, why, why does your choir have this sound and what, what makes it so unique? And um, I, I, gosh, I wish I knew what it was because if I did, I could you know, bottle it and take it somewhere. But the, I think <laughs> the combination of so many different things, it's, it's just that we've been so blessed with the people that we have. Another thing I think that's really important is that Houston is such a hotbed of talent and we have phenomenal mm. music schools that for every year produce outstanding singers and I can say that as an unbiased person because I went to the University of Texas so I'm not like a U of H fan or anything like that but they you know these <laughs> schools are really churning out these high quality singers that we snatch up when they're ready to be professionals and they succeed and and it makes such a difference and so I think I think we have the luxury of of being part of a cultural hotbed in one of the largest cities in the country and 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 what we're getting are the, is the fruits of that. A lot of choirs stick pretty rigidly to the, the classical repertoire. I think one of the things that makes the Houston Chamber Choir such an outstanding ensemble is that its repertoire is broader than just the classical repertoire. How do you feel about that? What's it like for you as, as a trained singer to branch out into, into popular music and, and jazz? Personally, I love it. I actually, when I was in college, I, I was in, uh, I was not a, a member of the School of Music, but I sang with the schools, uh, you know, with their classical ensemble. And I sang with a group called Longhorn Singers at UT, which was a profession, which is not professional. It's a collegiate show choir. And we did, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the things that you would see that the chamber choir now does with some, uh, some things from uh, Broadway, some jazz, uh, of course, on a very, very high and sophisticated level, uh, which is 
really exciting for me. I, and I think, you know, one of a, a, a choir director that I used to sing with told me once and told his group that the, the, thing, that, the thing that truly defines outstanding musicianship is versatility and the ability mm -hmm. to do multiple different things. And I think it's important as singers that we demonstrate that we are able to do that. And I think it also makes us better at all the different things we do. And, and you can see no matter what it is we're doing, and especially in these, these more, um, these less classical performances, there are a lot of solo opportunities and our singers who are all classically trained, you know, show up and, and compete with the best of them. And it's, it's a very fun thing for me, I love it. One of the things that, uh, as you have said, you know, the choir changes over time. People, people leave, new people come in, etc. Um, perhaps the one um, sort of bedrock uh, element is is Bob, mm -hmm. is Robert Simpson, the the founder and the artistic director. But what is it about Bob that you find uh, that you can draw such strength and clarity from well i think bob may tell you in a maybe a, a more eloquent way that how he manages to to do this year in year out with the consistent result is blood sweat and tears i mean he pours so much of himself into these this organization and i think one of the things that that's that makes bob who has been nationally recognized now and deservedly so as one of America's mm -hmm. uh, most most valued uh, choral conductors uh, is that he is such a he has such a knack for figuring out how to program a concert and whether we're doing you know the Bach B minor mass which is a piece that's more than two hours long and is a is an epic mm -hmm. performance um, or we're doing, you know, something that's a little bit more casual. You know, some of we we've done concerts in the past of singers' favorite choral pieces, and he really has a knack for putting something together in a way that the audience really loves, and that the singers will also love, and and be able to perform at a high level without losing their energy. And you know, it actually, you, you it now makes me think of this when you you ask what sets the chamber choir apart. I can think of so many times where you know, rehearsals may be kind of a slog. They are for every group and every person. But when we step onto that stage to perform, there is an energy that comes out of the choir and a, and a, and a product and a quality that comes out of the choir that is unlike anything that we have experienced up to date. And, and right. that is the kind of thing that Bob brings to the choir. And it's almost like a it's almost like we absorb it by osmosis. Like I can't point to some technique or something that he does that gets the result, but he you know, unquestionably gets the result no matter what. And obviously he has a phenomenal ear because he brings in all the voices and he he knows which voices will go well together, doesn't he? He knows he knows the perfect blend, if you like. He absolutely does. And and I think there is no greater example of that than the way that he fills out every year our soprano section it, it, that's one of the hardest most difficult sections to, to set because the sopranos mm. are very exposed and sing much higher are going to be heard over everyone else and and so it requires a true blend without that soprano section that he has a true knack for being able to piece together uh, we, we wouldn't be at the level we're at. So I have to give them some credit. Okay, in the time that you've been in the choir, what are some of the highlights for you? Well, uh, the very first concert we did was in the Co-Cathedral at the Sacred Heart down in, down in downtown Houston and, and doing some music with an organization that does only early music. And, and it was, uh, we were dividing up into choirs of two, three, and four. And uh, it was it was a really fun and exciting experience that for me sticks out because it showed me that the chamber choir was something special. I, I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had heard one concert that they did. They did a from music from the 1860s, and then in the second, which was the 1960s, they did all of these uh, Beatles arrangements, which was really phenomenal. But you know, um, right. So I had no idea what I was really walking into when I was doing that first concert, and and I realized like I'm in a I'm, this is really doing something special. Um, the, uh, the Mozart uh, 
Messiah, which we, it's, it's the, of course the Handel's Messiah, but Mozart reorchestrated it for a more modern orchestra. We did that that year too. And that was a very fun experience. Uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard not to talk about the Duraflay concert. We did the, the works of the complete choral works of, of Maurice Duraflay, which we, you know, enjoyed so much that we made a recording of it, which has enjoyed some, some amount of success. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, it won the Grammy, didn't it? Won it, a Grammy. It did happen to win a Grammy. I got to I got to be on stage for the Grammy, which I can honestly say I had never expected to have happen. But um, but so we, you know, but but those are kind of all big uh, major classical moments. But we have, you know, guest conductors too. Uh, Anton Armstrong, the of the Saint Olaf Choir. Uh, uh, Elena Sharkova. She's from Russia, and we did some Russian music with her. Um, you know, Kim Nazarian for our jazz concert. I mean, we just get to be around and see the most incredible people who are at the very highest level uh, of, of their craft. And, and to be able to be a part of that is like, I, there are lots of times in the chamber choir when I think I, this is, I never thought I'd be able to do this, or I can't believe this is kind of what I'm getting to do. It, it's a really, uh, it's hard to pick a highlight, but man, those are some good ones. What about favorite pieces? Are there any uh, pieces that uh, jump out as being among your favorites? Um, that's perhaps that's perhaps an unfair question because it's like like asking parents, you know, which is their favorite child. But I do have trouble picking. I, I have loved and listened regularly to choral music since I was a child, and and really, you know, um, picking out ones that are my absolute favorite are very difficult, and they change, you know, as you hear something new. I guess from like the stalwart, you know, I came into the chamber choir having performed the Bach B minor mass in a, in a different setting that I really did not enjoy. And, and it's a very long piece. And so if you're not enjoying it, it's a miserable experience. It's torture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, you know, Bob told us we were doing it and I kind of, I just kind of groaned. I was like, I don't know if I had the energy to do that, you know, and, <laughs> but seeing it with this choir, with the orchestra we had and then the way he conducted it, it was like nothing. It was, it was, it, 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 it was such an, it was such a powerful experience for me. And I, I now, it's one of my all time favorite pieces. Um, you know, on the more, um, on the more kind of contemporary side, uh, you know, there's a lot of, we've done a lot of works by uh, Eric Ezenbald, who wrote Stars, which I know we've featured a number of times. He has another piece. Yeah saying one time called Only in Sleep, where uh, Cami Estelle mm -hmm. is just a phenomenal solo that I, I fall in love with every time. Um, but gosh, you know, I am always full of suggestions for Bob about what we, you know, what we can do and, and what I'd love to do. But we also do so much new music that comes out. And, and I, that's always something that I really enjoy too, because you, you know, you don't know what that's going to sound like until you're doing it. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to pick. And my, my taste will, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, I probably have like 10 different things I can tell you, but that's, that's where I'm at right now. And you mentioned Eric Zessenwalds and uh, those Baltic composers, boy, can they write. They, they really can. And, you know, we did, uh, we had a concert in my first season in the Chamber Choir where uh, Paul Hillier, he gave us uh, music from, from the Baltics, from Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. And it was all some of the most interesting things. They were so difficult. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of them was in Polish. That was, that was my first time ever doing that. Um, that was a new one. Uh, but it's really, really fun. And, and, and uh, yes, those Baltic composers really know what they're doing. You are not only a musician in the choir, but you're, you're more heavily involved because you are the musician's representative on the board of the Houston Chamber Choir. What does that involve? And, and, how did you get roped into that? <laughs> well, actually, I'll, the credit for this idea, I think, 
goes back to uh, Wayne Ashley, who served as the musicians rep for the for the chamber choir uh, to the board for the first time. He did he served a two year term, and really the the idea came up, and and the board blessed it, and it's I think it's been a very successful thing. It's it's the I'm, I'm not a voting member, but I'm there to appear at meetings and represent the interests of the choir, and when things are discussed. Um, that involve effects that they may have on the choir. You know, I'm I'm given the opportunity to speak on that and and speak to what I believe to be the best interest of singers as best I can. And and I think mm -hmm. sometimes they indulge me to to just offer my own thoughts on other items for the board, and I'm very grateful for that too. But I the primary role is to make sure that that we have something that kind of liaises between the artistic side and the business side. To make sure that you know everyone's on the same page about about how that all works and it's it's worked very well the the office staff and our board are very cognizant of making sure that everything that they're doing uh furthers the ability of us to put out good music and keep the singers happy and so that's that's just part of that uh that's part of that process was it a revelation to you when you uh, when you saw the board at work and and you know you realize how much sort of behind the scenes planning and organization and debate goes on? I think for me, it wasn't so much the the learning of how the sausage gets made that was a re revelation for me <laughs> as much as it was how hard they work to make sure that we have the money required to make this happen and and right. You know, I mean, a lot of the things that we do are expensive. If you want to hire an orchestra, that's a massive expense for, for a group of our size. If you want to record, we're talking, you know, that's also just a massive expense. And, and when, when Bob says to the board, I really want to do this, you know, they will do what they can to make it happen. And, right. and that is, that's something to me that I think was sort of a revelation, which was not so much that you have to take the budget into account, I sort of took that for granted, but the, but, but that there's a lot that goes on of individual board members putting in the work to make it happen. And that I think is something right. that was really, was really wonderful and, and has been a positive sort of revelation for me. It's a shared vision, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, you know, our, our, I know our, our board president has said previously, you know, his goal is to is to make sure that the that the artistry level is at the highest level that it can possibly be, and that the business side, you know, is is commensurate with what the artistry can provide. And and, and I really think over the last over my tenure in the chamber choir that that has been absolutely true. And and you know, we've mm -hmm. been able to do all kinds of wonderful things and would have even ended up in New Zealand if not for, uh, you know, the last year that we've experienced. So that's, a, it's just a, you can really see that the board's work is, is uh, having a huge impact in a positive way. So I'm proud to be a part of it. And I think one of the other benefits of, uh, of being the musician's rep is that you got to go to Los Angeles for the uh, Grammy Awards. That must, I mean, that's one of those experiences that, that you know, you, you will tell your grandchildren about, isn't it? Well, I will, I will. And it's just such a, uh, I can honestly say I never thought that was going to happen. And I, you know, I had to kind of get work permission to do that. But I think when I told them what I was doing, they, they sort of felt like they couldn't say that was not okay. Um, you know, uh, you know, my, my, firm is, my firm has always been really supportive of me doing this. And they, they were all so happy for me and, and, uh, one of my one of the firm partners that I work with, she knows uh, Rick Kellogg, who was our board president, and he actually told her originally that that the Grammy uh, that we've been nominated for a Grammy, and she sent an email out to the entire firm. We have about two hundred employees, so I was just inundated with messages all congratulating. It was very fun, and they were all excited. Uh, it was so surreal. I also accept this award on behalf of the city of Houston, one of the real artistic capitals of our country. It is from this city that our musicians are drawn. We are friends and neighbors, and how amazingly talented. I, I think back on it now, it was really, it was probably the last thing I did um, uh, travel-wise and trip-wise before everything sort of shut down for an extended period of time, but it, it was a, 
Right. I will tell my grandkids about it. That is for sure. I, I, uh, I never expected to ever be in a position like that as a, as a, a, a choir member. But it, I mean, it may happen again. It might, you know, I, we, uh, I'm very proud of the work that we're putting into future recording projects. And, uh, I, I don't have enough no, a wood to knock on to offer any specifics on that, but we're going to, we're going to see what happens next. But I, I, it could, you just never know. You've mentioned that in real life, you're <laughs> a lawyer, if you like. Um, and I believe you, uh, you did your uh, law degree at uh, UT Austin. Is I that did. correct? What sort of law do you practice? So I am, I work in uh, the construction industry. My job is, hmm. uh, I, I'm what, I work in the construction section of our law firm and, and as, a, as a litigation associate. And so what I do is I get involved when, uh, when in construction projects, usually when people have disputes over payment, you know, whether someone didn't uh, do something at the right time or when they broke their contract, when there's peace, people who aren't getting paid, uh, you know, my job is to kind of either try to avoid those disputes and, and try to make everyone uh, happy uh, before we go mm -hmm. to court or to go fight for them in court if that's what it takes. Um, and I do other stuff outside of that, mostly like in a, in a business context. So I, I've never done anything on the, on the criminal side and, and feel very fortunate that, that that's, that just seems like something I'm, I don't quite have the stomach for. And I have vast respect for people who do, but that's, that's, uh, that's not for me. What was it that uh, made you want to be a lawyer? Always is just a fascination with the law. I can I can tell you that my dad is an attorney, and you know he when I told him that uh, I wanted to go to law school, his response was, "Are you sure?" Uh, you know, and and I think that he, <laughs> he knows that um, you know he he knows that that there are wonderful things about being an attorney, and there's some hard things about it, and so he was he really helped me understand what the what the day to day was like and what the challenges and the, and the, and the exciting things were. And so, um, you know, I took some classes in undergrad uh, to kind of about business and law and things like that. And, and really just nothing about it made me disinterested and made me more interested. And so I figured I'd, I'd give it a shot and it's, uh, it's worked out well. It, it's, it was, a I, I've, I've really, I loved my time in law school and, and I've been really lucky to, to be in a great work situation here in Houston. So it's, it's worked out great. What did you major in as an undergrad? <laughs> so I started out at UT Austin and the school of music with a choral music studies degree. Um, I did decide that, that as much as I love singing and performing in ensembles that the, that the academic nature of it, of the, of, of the of music and for whatever reason the study of it generally is a is a in a degree program was taking away my enjoyment from singing in ensembles i was not enjoying that anymore and mm. and so i really thought about that it's a hard thing to grapple with when you're uh, 19 or 20 years old but um you know came to the conclusion that and i knew i wanted to go to law school at that point and so i, I came to the conclusion that it would be healthier for me to leave the school of music, but stay performing in ensembles. And, and mm -hmm. I, so I went into the school of business and graduated with a marketing degree uh, before okay. going to law school. But I always had my hand in the, in the music school pot and was doing, uh, was we're still kept singing. I sang through in two different ensembles for all four years of college. So I, I, did, I did not want to give that up. And I'm very glad that I didn't. So you sort of got the best of both worlds. I like to think so. I, I mean, I try my best to be a little bit more well-rounded and, and, but, you know, sometimes I think back, especially in groups like the chamber choir where almost everyone has a music degree of some sort and, and whether it's undergrad or graduate. And I, I think sometimes if I, you know, I could have just stuck, I could have just stuck with it. And then I'd have that on my resume too. And it'd be easier for me to get my foot in the door with some organizations and things like that. But, um, I really feel like that that was what I needed to do. And that if I hadn't done that, then maybe I wouldn't have continued to pursue it and I wouldn't be where I'm at now. So it, it's just a, it's, mm -hmm. I, I think it worked for me. That's all I can really say yeah. about it. Where did you grow up? I, I grew up in Austin actually. So I sort of, okay. I, it wasn't really my, my life plan to grow up in Austin, go to college in Austin, and then go to law school in Austin, but in Austin, right. 
know, it's hard to argue with wanting to stay in that town. I, I think most people who aren't from there can tell you how much they love it. Um, it's a very different city than it was when I was born um, a certain number, you know, a number of years ago now, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it was very fun. And, and, you know, my family was very supportive of, of me going off to college and not, you know, having my college experience and not like not intruding upon it because we were in the same city. And so I, I, uh, and, and, and then with law school, it was kind of more of a function of, I, I didn't know for sure I was going to get into UC law. And when I did, it was like, okay, well, I guess I better go there because it's a very good school. Uh, and, yeah. and um, so I stayed right with right there. Um, I, I used to, the law school shares a cafeteria with the music school. So it was kind of really? fun. After I graduated and was in law school, I would see some of my old colleagues that were in the chamber singers there, like coming over there for lunch. And that was always kind of a, a, a fun thing. But so I, I was there until, uh, until I graduated. And are you from a musical family? Was your, was your household filled with music as you were growing up? Filled with music might be an understatement. Uh, my family is very musical and also just very supportive of, of, of their of all three I have two sisters of all three of us um pursuing what what our gifts are and mm -hmm. my older sister is a phenomenal singer uh recently came on board with the chamber choir which is very fun for me uh mm -hmm. she, she uh has her master's degree in choral conducting my younger sister is a fantastic singer and can play the ukulele which is always very fun for us <laughs> uh, Good. Dad is very talented. My mom is talented. You know, we we uh, so we were always encouraged, and music was nurtured in our house. And and when, uh, you know, when when it came time to to study music more seriously in middle school and high school, and and maybe at the expense of other activities that are more stereotypical, like athletics and things like that, you know. Our, Parents always wanted us to be well-rounded, but really wanted us to pursue our gifts. And we're very supportive. And I, I can guarantee you that that all of the success I have in, in music and in choral music is I, I would not have experienced without, without my family. That's absolutely the most important factor. So how were you introduced to the study of music? Presumably it was in middle school or high school, maybe even elementary school. It was more so, you know, in elementary school, we had music classes and, and sometimes I would, you know, I, I think at one point I kind of became aware, you know, my music teacher told something to my mom along the lines of, you know, he's, he's got some kind of singing talent and, and, you know, you should consider putting him into some kind of youth choir or something like that. And at the time we didn't do that because, you know, my, my mom kind of wanted, you know, me to pursue a lot of different things. And I got my, I got my music out of out of going to class and I did the same thing in middle school and, and in high school I started taking private voice lessons and that's really when hmm. kind of the, the light flip the, the, the light flipped and, and I became more serious. Uh, my high school choir director also is is just a phenomenal human being. Uh, Dr. Morris Stevens, who uh, recently was at St. Edwards, uh, is there in their music department for a number of years, but he is sort of an unfair. So there was university. St. Edwards University in Austin, yes. Yeah. Um, a, an unparalleled figure in education and, and just, I, I just owe so much of my love of music, my passion for choral music to him. And, and I would not have gone into the, into the study of music in college without, his, without the experience with him. And I, I just, mm -hmm. so I, you know, I, I, I think about the ways in which I really were, was, was affected by, by, this, by this art form. And it's my family growing up, and it's it's Doctor. It's I, we all called him Sir. It was his nickname, uh, which is not something he insisted on, but something that something that everyone called him. So it's odd for me to say Doctor Stevens, but every, everything is everything can be traced back to to those two influences for me. And in terms of your musical life outside of the Houston Chamber Choir, do you listen to music I in do. your car or at home or? So, so I do. Um, I have to confess that I 
listen to a lot of classical music and a lot of choral music mm -hmm. in particular. I'm always fascinated. To hear. Don't feel bad about the confession. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that some people come on here and, you know, we'll talk about, you know, that, you know, the, any number of artists that they love to listen to. And I like to keep up with what's popular and, and, and can rattle that off. But I, I really love hearing what other groups are doing. And especially I feel like we're in a time right now where choral music is at its absolute it's it's it, it's it's the most accessible that it's ever been because of because of virtual performances because of recordings um and just the number of professional ensembles that have appeared on the on the scene in the last 20 to 30 years there is a high mm -hmm. a really high level of performance of of pieces from 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 the most modern to the earliest music and i love to get to hear it and i love to hear it done at a high level i've become very spoiled by my time in the chamber choir that everything I, my, <laughs> my taste is much um i would call it maybe more sophisticated than it once was but i mean that went back to even in high school i remember one time you know this back in i i feel like i'm really telling on myself here the act of burning a cd where you actually put the the, the songs on a cd and create it um and would listen mm -hmm. to it and one time my mom thought it, i think thought it was her cd and put it in and was listening to it and, and it was just a bunch of choral music and she she told me one time and said, you know, I really, and this is kind of the way that she would nurture my, my interest. She would say, I really think if this is something that you're listening to like that on a regular basis, if this is something that you need to consider doing for your, for your career for full time. And, 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 you know, rather than saying, Hey, like, why is a 15 year old kid listening to, you know, some John Rutter piece, it was a lot more of an encouragement of, Hey, you must really love this stuff. And so um, that's true too today, for sure. Is your mother a musician? She took piano lessons and she, I think she sang in, in the choir when she was in school and sometimes at church, but no, she was not, I don't, she was never trained as a musician. And my, my dad, um, mm -hmm. I think sang in more formal settings than she did, but he also is not trained, uh, you know, formally. So you say you, you like to listen to classical music. Do you have any particular favorite composers or favorite works? I, I really could probably more tell you, um, you know, favorite ensembles that I like to listen to if we're doing the, if we're doing, Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I really am, I have sort of um, a, 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 a very popular answer, which is true for me is Volchus 8 uh, out of, that operates out of London. London. Uh, and I've gotten mm -hmm. them uh, perform in Houston a couple of times. In fact, they, they, they usually finish their world tour in Houston every year. Uh, and, and this year, this past year in 2020, finished their tour in Houston before getting on one of the very last flights that was leaving out of the United States to get back home. Um, it was kind of a dramatic yeah. exit for them, I think, but I love listening. I've to interviewed them a couple of times. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure you have. I love it when they come to Houston because they're so, they, 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 co they collaborate with St. Luke's and they're, they're, they're just so gracious and, and, and really take the time to appreciate where they are and, and work with the people that they're with. And I, so I love them on a personal level and, 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 and their music is just so phenomenal. Uh, and, and so I really love that. Um, I always keep on top of what Consperare out of Austin is doing. They, um, I actually sang with them before and, and uh, Craig Halla Johnson is, is an incredible force in the choral conducting world. And so I, I, uh, I, I, mean, I have a lot of friends that are there and, and several, several connections through there that got me connected to Bob, which I owe a lot to. Uh, and so I always like to keep up on top of what they're doing. And, you know, I, I have to say for me that one thing that's changed a little bit is, you know, I do go poking around when the Grammy no nominees get announced and start listening to see what they're up to. Um, uh -huh. you know, and, and, you know, when we were nominated, I was very interested to see what, um, what was going on and what we were competing against. And, Consperare was one of those. Was one of those. They've won Grammys before for a couple of different uh, collaborations. And uh, the Crossing out of Philadelphia, Donald Nally conducts them. They're all doing new age things, and they're phenomenal. Um, so it's mm. it's more of a if I hear something that I think is great, I I go find who did it, and I get all of their stuff, and I'll go back through their history and pull all of their stuff, and and that's really fun for me. It's kind of like a, I'm, ex, I'm experiencing something new and, and finding something new. And, and so I'm always kind of looking for that. So what have you been listening to most recently? Do you have any, any new discoveries? 
You know, not lately because unfortunately the, the sort of the market on on new on new music is is a little bit dry right now because we haven't had you know the normal opportunities to be recording over the last year that have that have been coming. And I know you know the Chamber mm-hmm. Choir has an album that we're waiting to have released, but but that's been that's been held up a little bit due to due to COVID nineteen. And so I haven't I haven't done as much of that lately. I've been kind of going back to um, you know the old favorites, but I haven't. I I have to be honest, I usually have music playing, but but it's an interesting phenomenon that lately, and I think it may just be because I'm so busy, I I haven't had it playing. And that's something that I'm thinking about now. And I'm I'm gonna go back and start changing that again because it adds so much, it adds so much of a positive influence to my day. Is the your choral life, is that something that you see continuing until your dying breath? Or is it something that that will may have to fall by the wayside as the lawyering takes over. You know, I all I can really do is is take every year as it comes and be and consider it a blessing to be able to do both for as long as I can. Um, you know, there may be a time where family obligation uh, or work obligation makes that too difficult. Uh, we haven't hit that yet, and I I right. I don't. You know, I, I guess when the time comes, maybe I'll know. But um, right now, I'm still going full steam ahead. I I think that this is such an interesting and unusual. Uh, it's not a hobby. I don't want to say it's a hobby because I I am a professional singer and the choir is professional, and I don't I don't think it's fair to apply that label. But people that in the industry that don't know me and don't know the chamber choir may consider it a hobby, and so I use that term. Um, my it's something that's very unique to the people that I work with that they that they're not used to, and so they're very they always end up being very supportive of it because it's a when they when someone sees that you're doing something on a high level that's not just sort of a pet project it's it makes it it makes it different so that you can say, you know, I need to leave. You know, as a lawyer, sometimes you have late nights, and there are plenty of times where on a Monday where I've said I have to leave, I have rehearsal, and not one single time has anyone ever told me you cannot do that, and right. So, and I think that's just because of the level at which we're operating and they know that it's something serious. Uh, And so I'm going to ride that wave as long as I can. And, uh, and I hope that it's, I hope that it keeps going for a long time, but I do know that no matter what, I will always be singing because I, I have to, it's just not something that I can let go of forever. And in the times in my life, where I have let go of it when I was in law school. And then when I, when I, my first year of practice, you know, I, it became very obvious very quickly that that had to change. So do you think being a singer makes you a better lawyer? I actually think that there's a lot in common between law and, and people who practice law and people who perform and, and study music. And, and the reason I say that is because mm-hmm. they are both, uh, jobs that require a, t- a stress tolerance that's higher probably than a lot of jobs. They also require a lot of outs, you know, especially in school, outside of classroom time. Uh, and you really have to love what you're doing. You have to pour a lot of yourself into it and you can't kind of go halfway in order to be good at what you do. And so I think, I guess it does make me probably a better lawyer because it it provides another a it provides an outlet for me that allows my you know one side of my brain maybe to get a little bit of a break, but it also they complement each other because they require similar skills and and even though you know but you know, it's they, they require I mean I stand up and and make an argument in court that's a performance in and of itself in a lot of ways. And, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, but, and I, and and you spend all of this time outside of that performance doing legal research and drafting your argument and writing and, 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 and all of those things, it's very similar. And I, and so I think that it, maybe it helps me be more prepared for what those processes are going to look like and how to actually, uh, Stand, you know, not be not be so nervous and just kind of enjoy the performance aspect because you've done all the hard work beforehand. So I think that's I think that's pretty much that's I think they're similar for that reason. So yeah, I think I think they both help make me better at 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 the other. 
And you mentioned that you uh, you have two sisters who are both very musical. Is there uh, is there some sibling rivalry that goes on when you get together for Thanksgiving or Christmas? Or no, we I, they'll both admit this. We hate singing and like at like family obligations. We get so embarrassed. I don't know why, but it's like <laughs> no. I mean, I think maybe back when when my older sister and I were closer in age, we're we're doing you know the. The, the Texas all state process and would and we'd sing we'd kind of there'd always be a little bit of looking over the shoulder at which ranking one got versus the other but that's about the most I could tell you I I, I really I really don't think that there's a lot of competition there uh, we we just we all are pretty easy going about that <laughs> And now that um, COVID restrictions are gradually uh, lightening up, how does it feel to be to be back rehearsing and and performing again? Well, I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to describe really because it's the the music is something able to make music is something that is so important and and when we went through a period of time where we couldn't it was it was hard like but mm. in in other and in, in the ways that everything was hard uh you know and so i think some the initial frustration and discomfort with that was swallowed up by so many other things that were happening in the world and when we finally came back to start making some, you know, limited music under very restrictive circumstances in November, it really felt like taking a breath of fresh air. But like everything else related to COVID, you know, I, you, there's always something a little bit that takes that that takes a little bit of the joy out of it. You know, you you have to be so far apart. You have to wear the the, the mask, and we have these, thankfully, have these singing masks that are that are much that give you a lot more space in front, and that's very that that makes it so much more comfortable. Uh, and right. You know, but but there's a there's a feeling a little bit like the color is sapped of, of sapped out of the picture a little bit, and and I think that over time as these things reduce, that will change. And and I I think that when we do one day have a performance where we stand up on the stage without a mask on and we're able to sing to a live audience, we will that will be an energy that we feel that I haven't felt in quite some time. I'm very much looking forward to when that happens. And I mean, one thing that has come out of the pandemic in some respects is that uh, there aren't many people that can say they've rehearsed in a multi-story car park. <laughs> yeah, that was our more interesting uh, uh, accommodation and it worked. It worked really well. Um, and, you know, we might have had some audio difficulties. Thank goodness it didn't rain. Uh, that was there was one day where it was really <laughs> cloudy and I thought, well, this could be a disaster. But no, we we've managed to make it work. And, and I guess it just goes to show you that singers will find a way to keep singing. And, and, and when they haven't done it for long enough, they'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. Well, look, Jack, it's been great to talk to you and to learn more about you and uh, to you know, realize that, uh, you know, singers also have jobs outside of singing. So many of the, of the singers um, are music teachers or in, you know involved in in music education in some way and uh, you're one of those rare ones that uh, that I was going to say has a real life but you know what I mean um, well, has a has a, a non-singing side it's true I think it's actually there are actually now maybe more than than you think that that end mm -hmm. up end up working in ways that are outside the music industry I mean I know we've had software engineers We've had people who work in insurance, people who work in building management, um, you know, all kinds of different professions that end up popping up and into the into the choir. And and I I think it's wonderful. And I but I think that what's even more interesting about it is that all of these people still have, you know, some high level of musical training and and right. find their way to they find their way back to doing something that they really love, regardless of what their day job requirements are. And so I, I, you know, that's, that's something that's really special. And, and I, I think you're right that the vast majority of the choir, because of 
their talent level and their study of music um, work in that industry in some way. But, you know, there are a couple others that, that, uh, that you'll find uh, pop up throughout the, throughout the seasons. It's the, the call of the choral joy. You really can't run from it once you're really locked in. Yeah. Jack, thank you very much for talking to us and best wishes for the upcoming season. Thank you so much, Sinjin. Good to talk to you. Thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir. As a patron, as a subscriber, as an audience member, we really appreciate all that you do to make the Houston Chamber Choir successful. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sinjin Flynn. Please join us again next time on Behind the Music. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue making new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.